do you have a method to kind of rein that in if it, if it starts to spiral out of a place that you don't want it to go? I mean, do you do you leave, do you put it on the table for a while and just come back to it, or? Well, it depends on who's the boss, I guess. I mean, uh, if it's your record and you're producing it, and you if you don't like the way someone's playing, you can make a suggestion you can fire them or you can pick up the guitar and play it yourself i don't know yeah. you know do what you got to do to make it to make it come out the way you want yeah um can, let's let's get back to talking about arkansas uh can you tell us about the uh specifically a little bit about your your passion for mississippi john hurt and and share the story of that uh acoustic guitar sure um when I was uh, in the early 60s during the folk revival, <laughs> during the folk revival, um, I, I think, you know, I feel like I was in the right place at the right time. Just growing up, uh, just had gotten out of high school, you know, I was still in high school in Philadelphia. Uh, and Philadelphia was a hotbed of music on a lot of levels. You know, in terms of R&B and soul music, uh, the Uptown Theater on North Broad Street was, every Saturday night I could see the greatest R&B performers of all time. I saw Otis Redding and you know, Sam and Dave and the Temptations and the Miracles. And I saw Stevie Wonder do fingertips when he was 12 years old. Um, and then on the other side of the coin, the Philadelphia Folk Festival, which is now 53 years and still going on. Um, I got to see people like Doc Watson and Mississippi John Hurt, Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee, all the um, re recently, uh, you know, rediscovered roots and blues men, uh, people who were and also the more contemporary people like Joan Baez and Dave Van Ronk and people like that. So I, I had this incredibly um, uh, amazing palette of music as a young kid to draw from. And I met, a, I met a guy in Philadelphia named Jerry Ricks who became my guitar teacher and mentor. And he uh, also worked with a lot of these uh, rediscovered blues men as they came to Philadelphia because you know they didn't have any money, they couldn't stay in a hotel, so they would sleep on his couch, and I would be there, and I would, you know, I got to hear them play, you know, firsthand, and I watched, you know, watch their fingers, and so it wasn't just learning by, you know, dropping the needle on a record, which is what most people had to do in those days, uh, and so Mississippi John Hurt in particular was a, a favorite of mine, and um, I studied him, I learned to play all his songs, uh, and um, just was more recently. I was actually able to purchase the Guild F30 uh, guitar that was given to him when he played Newport Folk Festival in 1963. So I have that guitar now. So it really, the music just came full circle. So I have it, you know, I sit in my, I sit in my music room and on one side of the room I have a picture of Mississippi John Hurt playing that guitar. And on the other side of the room I have a picture of my buddy Jerry Ricks who taught me so many of these things. And I kind of sit between them. And like, depending on what I'm playing, you know, I'll turn this way or I'll turn this way. And I feel like I'm in the vortex of this vibe, you know, that I can get. Uh, but just having that guitar and having a personal connection to uh, that, that great American music tradition is really important to me. Yeah. One of, one of the things I really love about uh, your Arkansas album, you were, you were kind enough to give me a copy on vinyl. Um, and this is one of the things I think that's really missed out by it. By streaming music is that you don't get the actual hard copy, you don't get the liner notes. But if you get this album on record or on CD, the liner notes, there's a history lesson behind each song, and it's it's just really it, it, there's so many names behind each song because each song is kind of inspired by some different blues players and uh, rack time and you know. Well, what, what happened on that record was. Um... I started out to make a tribute to Mississippi John Hurt, but as I did, and we, we cut a couple tracks, um, I re at the end I realized that it would be too limited. And I didn't want to just, you know, say, okay, I'm copying, here's this, another song that I learned to play. Uh, there's a million people that can play these songs, and some better than others, or whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, but I, I, what I started to realize, was I started to see the link between uh, this great music tradition that came up from the Deep South, and I began to realize it was the genesis of American pop music, American popular music, as it came up the Mississippi River, Memphis, of course, and all these incredible touchstones, the Delta, Memphis, or New Orleans, of course, and then St. Louis and on to Chicago and 
and the birth of rock and roll and all that. So uh, the, the record took on a different level. I, I began to dig back and I said, well, what was the first pop song? You know, what was the first pop song? Well, how do you define a pop song? If it's played on the radio and you can buy it on a record and a lot of people like it, that's a pop song in, in my definition. So I went back and, and discovered the first million selling record from 1923 uh, by a guy named Emmett Miller. And I said, well, I said, maybe I should do that song. So once I, once I unlocked that, the, the album took on a completely different texture. Um, so I, I began to see that Mississippi John Hurt, uh, I did a little digging into his history, and uh, he was a giant fan of Jimmy Rogers, one of the great godfathers of American country music. Now that surprised me, but then it started to make sense, and I said, okay, I'll do a Jimmy Rogers song. So the, the album began to become, as you said, a sort of a history of early, early pop, uh, pre-rock and roll. And I think that people, especially the younger generation, should realize that there was a great American popular music tradition that preceded rock and roll by 30 or 40 years. Um, and really, you know, it coincides with the invention of the radio and the popularity of the phonograph machine. So that's what the album is really about. Uh, I want to go back to co-writing experiences. Uh, I heard that you actually had some interesting ones with Ludacris and Jimmy uh, Potterville. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. Uh, you know, that's funny, right in itself. You had an interesting songwriting experience with Ludacris and Jim Lauderdale. That, I love that. Jim Lauderdale would love that. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I got, I met Ludacris and he asked me to come to Atlanta to uh, co-write and uh, flew me down there and put me up in a beautiful hotel and I showed up at the studio and there was a bunch of guys and we started, I brought an acoustic guitar, which I don't think any of them had ever seen. Um, and uh, we started writing and um, I said, well, let's, let's record this. And the engineer went, how? And I said, well, we'll plug the guitar in or give me a mic. And he goes, well, I never did that. And I was like, oh boy, okay. I'm in a whole other world here. So uh, they were doing samples and they were just grabbing samples and doing, you know, getting drum beats and grooves and putting together things like that. So I'm playing the guitar and I'm going, I, I don't know if this is gonna work or not. Um, but Ludacris was really cool, and he seemed to dig it. Um, maybe he probably took my guitar riffs, and they're probably on one of his records somewhere. Uh, somewhere. I don't care. I think that's great. Uh, Jim Lauderdale, on the other hand, is a, you know, a whole other world. He's uh, an amazing, amazing person. One of the funniest people I've ever met. Great, inspired musician who, well, you know, we're writing together in the middle of the night, and all of a sudden he'll just stand up and walk around the room and close his eyes and he'll just sing something and I'm like that's amazing and I'll just figure out some chords and the next thing you know we got a song so it's just uh, every every collaboration is unique and every collaboration I think in a way is um, you're trying to unlock the, the personality or the motivation inside your uh, co-writer and if you can unlock that and bring it out and sometimes your job is to help them articulate their vision and sometimes your job is to have them help you articulate your vision. And sometimes it's a little bit of, of all of that. So every, every songwriting collaboration is unique. You had done a lot of collaborations on your record before Arkansas, uh, Good Road to Follow, right? Yeah. Um, well, that was an album of collaborations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, can you tell us about some of those? Well, you know, having been in Nashville for a long time, I. Um, I just realized there was just such amazing wealth of incredibly talented people, and I just wanted to tap into that somehow or another. And I thought I'd love to step into their world rather than asking them to step into my world. So I reached out to the people I liked. I mean, literally across the board, uh, anyone I thought was cool or enjoyed their work. Uh, everyone from Vince Gill to Ryan Tedder to Tommy Sims to. Uh, a band uh, called Hot Shell Ray, um, to um, you know, to Jim Lauderdale, and uh, you know, uh, Craig Wiseman, amazing song, country songwriter. And basically, I just told them, I said, I just want to, I just want to make a record and write a song the way you. I want, I want to do what you do, and I want to kind of get, in, I want to pick your brain and be part of that. And that was the theme of the Good Road to Follow album. 
And so, because for me, music has always been what I call a good road. It's a it's a road that's taken me to places that I never could have imagined, and uh, you know, given the experiences that I you know could have only dreamed about. So, um, the good road to follow has become a theme for me, a musical theme. For me. What advice would you give to uh, songwriters today? Um, you know, it's the time-honored advice that uh, I think has never gone out of style. You know, listen to the people you like. Try to emulate the, the people that you like, whether they be songwriters or artists. Try to uh, understand, you know, um, if you emulate them, and, and by emulating, I mean literally copying them. Because in copying someone, you have to learn the chords. You have to learn their unique way that they impose melody over a chord. And to me, that's the personality of the artist and songwriters, the unique combination of melodic, melodic uh, choices over harmonic choices. So, you know, I mean, you can play a C chord, and there's a million notes that you can use over that C chord, but it's those unique choices that you make that make the melody unique and make it your own. And once you unlock that, and you see how other people are doing what they do, you can get an insight into perhaps something that you could do. And by copying them, perhaps you can, you know, your an individual style can emerge. I think is that about wrapping up for our questions? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. 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 Are there uh, are there any songs that you wish you had written? <laughs> Wow, <laughs> yeah, a zillion. Um, I wish I wrote the entire Joni Mitchell album, Blue. That is one of the greatest records of all time for me. It's a benchmark of creativity on every level. So, But there's, there, you know, sure, I wish I wrote Stairway to Heaven. I wish I wrote Twist and Shout. I mean, I mean there's no way to stop. I mean, yeah. um, should we open it up for audience questions? Yeah. In the interest of logistics and perhaps fire code, we'll take questions from the people in the front. And if you have, if you're in the back and you have a question, you can make your way somewhere where we don't trip getting the mic to you. Okay, okay. that sounds good. When thinking about contemporaries like um, Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel or Lennon and McCartney or Pagan and what 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 is your what is your takeaway from those uh, artists? In terms of what? In terms of how they influenced you, and, and um, what what your takeaway? How do you view them from your perspective? Well, I think that I view them as the names you mentioned as some of the great songwriting uh, and artist collaborations of in, in pop music history. Um, the way I look at it is, uh, I think um, I, I you know Daryl and I are part of that great tradition of songwriting teams. You know, you go back to Lieber and Stoller and, you know, and people like that and the Gershwins, you know, George and Ira Gershwin. You know, I, I, I don't I don't look at music in terms of, uh, you know, putting a time stamp on it. To me, great music is great music. I, I don't care what the style is. I don't care when it was written. Um, you know, so, so, you know, the songwriting team has always traditionally been a classic form that uh, has worked because I think people like to bounce ideas off of each other. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, in regards to songwriting, how do you know when, how do you edit yourself? How do you know when it's too much? And then also, how do you know when the song is done? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, you just, I mean, I, I have one surefire uh, way to judge. If I'm writing and I get goosebumps, literally real goosebumps on my arms, I know something's happening. And it happens to me a lot. Well, it doesn't happen to me enough, but it does happen. Um, and I don't know, you just have to, I think um, it's important to, uh, I think one of the beauties of being a songwriter is that you create something and then you can perform it. And you can play it for someone as opposed to being an author who writes a book, who you know spends months and months, years and years, whatever, writing this book and then has to wait until people read it and maybe they get reviewed or whatever. 
we have a, we have an immediate litmus test for what's happening. So you write a song, and even if it's incomplete, you can play it for someone and say, "Hey, I wrote this. I got. I think I got a great chorus here." And maybe you get a response. And if you get that response, it might be enough to keep on going and finish the verse. Um, so I think that's the beauty of songwriting, and it's something that 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 makes songwriting very unique in terms of the arts. Uh, so I got a question for independent artists. How does a songwriter get into a co-writing session with you? Oh, well, um, are you asking me to write a song? <laughs> Screw you, man. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, it, it, seriously, I, um, it, you know, it happens through friends to me. Um, first of all, I don't have a lot of time to do it because I'm touring constantly now. So when I do, I really just, um, I work with people who uh, who I know and I like. I, I don't really do reach out to, and, and I, I don't mean this in a diss in any way. I just, it, it's just too difficult to take a kind of a long shot with anybody, you know, because, you know, sure, you might get surprised and it might be awesome, but then again, it might not be. So I, I guess as I've gotten a little bit older, I've just become a little more, you know, kind of, I'm circling the wagons a little bit more. Hi. Um, my question is, when you find yourself uninspired, how do you find inspiration? Uh, I get a lot of great ideas. On, on I, I hike a lot. I walk a lot. Um, I get a lot of ideas when I'm driving. I never listen to the radio in the car, uh, but I've always got my cell phone with my little voice memo thing ready to go. And sometimes I'll um, just hum something or something might just pop in my head. For me, silence and uh, new environments are really good um, catalysts for ideas. Like I just came back from a European tour a few days ago, and uh, just being, just walking the streets in Europe um, was great for me because I, there are different sounds going on outside, different the sound of different languages, you know, all that stuff. So I think I think as a songwriter, the best thing to do is keep your antenna up and open so that you can receive those things when, when they when if you're lucky enough to get them.